Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Seditionists. Uh, it's been a while. Keith and I have been busy. We've been having a lot going on and with the holiday break and everything, but uh, th that only means we, we have a lot of pent-up frustration that we're ready to unleash, <laughs> so uh, it feels good to be back. Um, I think what we want to start with today is is a trend that, that I'm starting to see and feel, and it's sort of sort of getting to me, and I want to get Keith's interpretation of this. Um, you know, back when the original textbook came out, you know, however long ago that was, but prior to having any tools, uh, the textbook came, and I'm sure it was such a relief to teachers because they had something to work with. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of schools now, um, through through I want to call it corporate takeover, uh, where they've taken education, they've taken this idea of a textbook, and have given you the complete system, where you read the chapter, you do the worksheet, then you take home the other worksheet that you bought out of the other book, and it's become this this cyclical problem. Um, I would venture to guess to say there are a lot of school districts out there that teachers could not teach if you took that textbook away from them. Uh, I also would venture to guess to say they don't have a curriculum anymore. The textbook is their curriculum. Um, and my concern is I'm seeing some technologies go the same direction. Um, and that, that scares me because what a lot of these corporations have done now and is have taken away the book and put it into the computer, taken away the worksheets and thrown them up on the smart board. That doesn't make for good teaching. And I'm worried the technology is just going to go the same way the textbook and 10, 20 years from now, we're going to be sitting having a conversation saying, how did this happen? Keith, what are your thoughts? Yeah. You know, uh, the, I don't know the original, original textbook, but I think of the McGuffey Reader, which would be 1836, 1837. And it was um, the sort of resource that a teacher would walk through lessons with. Um, it was a very structured and very regimented um, set of things that you did, but it was still a resource. The publication was not verbatim script teaching, rote teaching or anything like that, but it was very structured and very rigorous. And if you took a group of McGuffey readers out of a classroom circa 1840, I would have the same concern that you just expressed, Rob, is does this teacher have the pedagogical facility, the curricular innovation, the knowledge of the craft of teaching, as I write about an insurrection, I call it the craft. Do they have the background in both their content and in teaching to be able to continue to instruct? Has the McGuffey reader become not just a resource, not just a tool, but it has become the hub around which all other teaching must occur? And it goes directly to something you and I have talked about extensively, and there's a reason we're talking about the 19th century here, is that's industrial model thinking, to say that this is the way we're going to do it. It's a very regimented approach, and you can't deviate from that. If technology is being used in that way, well, there's, a, there's a quote that um, a mentor of mine, uh, Priscilla Norton, used in grad school that stuck with me. And she said, as teaching educational technologists, lots of people think of us as, you know, the IT guys. We're not that, you know, I mean, Rob and I have had this discussion a hundred thousand times. My background is pedagogy. I'm a teaching teacher. I teach teachers how to teach better. That's my role. Technology is any tool that mitigates, that mediates the learner and their environment. A book is technology. It is the original form of educational technology. Well, maybe not the original, I guess clay tablets would be, right? Um, if that becomes the thing and you can't do anything without it, and your pedagogy is focused on the tool, you've lost child centeredness and genuine teaching. So, I was having a conversation with my math coach earlier today. We're talking about using manipulative apps. If you have a bin of manipulative blocks in a math classroom, use those, right? The app may become an, an, an analog to that to demonstrate mastery 30 kids at a time rather than one at a time. But it, the technology is supposed to provide additional opportunities for good teachers. It's not supposed to be just one thing. Probably the most distilled and extreme version we see of that is online learning, where the curriculum is unbelievably linear, unbelievably scripted and rote. And if it, those applications of technology to me as an educational technologist are very disturbing. Absolutely. And um, I, I want to I want to quote, I, I think it was Steve Jobs that said this, but I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to look it up. But um, there was always a really interesting quote. This was back when uh, teachers got very concerned that technology was going to take over uh, education. And, and the, the gentleman said, uh, a quality teacher will never be taken away by technology. 
Um, now I think we need to look at that statement as quality. You know, yes, there are teachers that could be replaced by technology very easily. It's the quality <laughs> teachers, the ones that are going to go beyond what we can create with technology that are going to still be around. Think about this. Think about Watson. Think about um, even uh, Amazon Echo. You know, it's getting to the point where you can create chatbots to ask you challenging questions, digest your answer, and personalize for you on the spot. That's going to be the future of tutoring. Wouldn't be surprised if it's the future of a lot of our cyber schools because it's going to be cost effective and it's just as good as a human brain. So as a teacher, think about this. What are you going to do differently that a chat bot can't do? That's create situations, simulations, ideas, uh, debates, and all of those things that Keith and I talk about. That's how you're going to become something unique. That That's how we're always going to be able to trump the AI intelligence, because if you don't, they're common people. Keith. Yeah, you know, uh, adaptive learning systems obviously have a role to play when it comes to, say, practicing your skills. When it comes to developing and practicing math fact fluency in grade two, you can use a, a, an app. I won't name any specific ones, but, you know, I don't want to endorse. But there are specific apps that do have really good, really structured adaptive learning uh, systems that will allow students to practice their skills and gain that fluency. That's fine. It's a supplement to the teacher who might otherwise be saying one at a time and take kids through it. Now you can do more with less in terms of time because of the simultaneity. But if you don't have a thoughtful mathematics pedagogue designing those opportunities, implementing that in certain places, and, and not just dumping kids into fact fluency practice without having directly instructed in a meaningful, individualized, personalized way, the skills that are prerequisite to that practice I mean, even if you use an antiquated model like Madeline Hunter, you can't get to individual practice until you've had your guided practice and your direct instruction. There has to be teaching first before you dump kids in. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't um, uh, a certain degree of autodidacticism that has been empowered through technology for people that choose that. Like I, the other day, I screwed up the laminator. I, but I, I, amazingly enough, I was making something with paper. We were making a sign for our new recycling center, right? You gotta and be it, careful, like, man, people those were teachers like, will get you if you break their stuff. No doubt. And like, and particularly the poor lady in the front office was like, that's my baby over there. And so, and of course, people are looking at me, they're going, is Reeves printing? And they're like, it, it's the fourth horseman. It's the sign of the apocalypse. But I did this thing and I fed it and somebody hadn't let it feed through in the back and it got wrapped around the roller. And Marty, the lady in the front office was like, do you want me to come fix it? And I'm like, I got this fam, because it's a new skill that I want to have. I don't want to become the laminating police, but I don't know how this piece of technology works. I'd like to learn. Got a YouTube video, watched it, taught myself because those modalities work for me. There are plenty of kids out there that are doing the same thing with everything from coding to building furniture to inventing. That's fine. We can afford students the opportunity to be autodidactic without abandoning them to autodidacticism and insisting that they be alone. If we do not have a thoughtful pedagogical practitioner designing personalized experiences based on our understanding of that individual child's uh, development, modality, and preference, no technology could possibly be used thoughtfully in that way. You know, we've got to be, we got to have the adult first, the, the human first, just like you said. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to make one more point and then we're going to wrap this up here. One more point for you, Keith. And this is for all you teachers out there. I want you to really think about this and I want you to answer this question as honestly as you can, because I think if you answer it honestly, you're going to sort of get a feel for what Keith and I are trying to say here, because we can talk to her blue in the face, but until you feel it and, and you can experience what we're trying to say, I'm not sure you're going to get it. So Keith, we're going to use you as a guinea pig here, buddy. <laughs> can you tell me, think back to a time that you had probably one of the best lessons you've ever had from a teacher. Just one of those moments that you were just like, this is so awesome. I learned some stuff. What was the experience like? Can you tell me a little bit about the lesson? 
Uh, my biology teacher in high school, Dr. William Kushner, genius teacher, really into experiential learning. So in authentic situations, we did a lot of lab. We did a lot of actually doing the thing um, in, in learning the different aspects, particularly when it came to some of the biological chemistry components of learning college level biology in high school. Um, I was energized. I was excited. I was entertained because he was such a good storyteller, but it wasn't all about him. It was giving us the opportunity to do the thing. So I was active. I was engaged. I had choice because I wasn't forced to work with certain people. So the learning environment really worked for me because it afforded me choice. It afforded me preference. I was given the opportunity to express myself visually, which I was much better at than writing. So I felt comfortable, engaged, energized, interested. It was an exciting lesson. Excellent. Some of the, some of the things that I pulled out from that comment was uh, it fits your style. It, it was did. fun. It was entertaining. So think about that for a minute. Now what I'd like you to do, Keith, is tell me your favorite worksheet that you did back in fourth or fifth grade. And what did you learn from that favorite worksheet? Can I don't you remember ever remember. A favorite worksheet. I remember hating worksheets. <laughs> I remember losing worksheets. I, I remember being point. punished for not doing worksheets, yes. even though I did well on the test. Yeah, and I, I hated I, that crap. I think that's the point. The point is, folks, you don't you don't have those memorable moments with 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 the garbage lessons. You know, you yeah. remember these experiences, the simulations, the things that were entertaining, the things that were uh, engaging. That's what you remember as a future student. And if you don't remember it now, chances are you're probably not using the skills right now either because you just simply don't remember it. If you remember, like I remember doing a fifth grade simulation on colonial times and we actually had to act like colonial students where awesome. you know, we had the dunce cap if you did something wrong. I mean, the whole nine yards. And I remember that. And I could tell you, I have a fairly strong historical understanding of that time period because of that simulation. If they had given me worksheets and made me read it or just sit there and do, I, I wouldn't remember a thing. So I Absolutely. think that's our point. Keith, wrap us up, buddy. Yeah, man, I, I, I failed fourth grade mathematics, not because I didn't have the skills, but because I was punished for not cottoning on to this thing that bored me to tears. And I have often wondered over the years what my life could have been like if I hadn't been turned off math because I was forced to do this grueling industrial nonsense that even then, prior to any study of pedagogy, I knew just didn't work for me. Um, that's it for another episode of The Seditionist. Get down there in the comments. Make sure you subscribe, share around. Tell us what you want to hear us talk about. Thanks, as always, for your comments. Rob Furman, Keith Reeves, see you next time. Bye, everyone.